Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Jeff John Falls, inviting you to tune in to a Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to a Taste of Louisiana. Thanks so much. What great music right here, huh? The Larry Miller Band, y'all, huh? <laughs> and, uh, and Larry's going to tell us a little bit more in a minute about the rest of the uh, crew there. It's so wonderful to have you here as we continue here in my kitchen to discover the unique food cultures of Louisiana. All of the French and the Spanish and the Germans and the Italians and the Native Americans and the Africans and all of the great contributions they made to our cuisine. So we're going to be cooking a lot of wonderful dishes. We want you to have a lot of good fun. We're going to listen to music. We have some great interviews and I'm feeding you. Oh yeah, I'm feeding you. Everybody has that quarter? Huh? Anyway, when people think of Louisiana, the Cajun people seem to instantaneously jump to mind. These fun-loving people embrace a joie de vivre, a joy of life not quite found in other cultures. But their story is one of intense hardship, expulsion, murder, exploitation, and families torn apart from one another. We begin the story of Louisiana's Acadians or Cajuns here on the banks of the Bayou Teche in beautiful St. Martinville, Louisiana. Their history begins in the 15th century in the region northeast of present-day Maine. England claimed this area first, followed by France some 25 years later. The French named it La Acadie, or Acadia. By 1605, Samuel de Champlain, a Frenchman from the Loire Valley, founded Port Royal, which was the first permanent settlement north of the Gulf of Mexico. As you know, the colonies predates the founding of Jamestown and Quebec, but the thing that really makes it distinctive is not its age, it's the fact that its original population was drawn from a fairly small geographical area in France, an area in the province of Poitou. So these people, when they were transplanted into North America, came to the New World with a common linguistic and cultural background. In 1613, the English destroyed Port Royal and thus began the English and French controversy over this land, which ensued well into the 18th century. In 1713, Britain officially took possession of Acadia with the Treaty of Utrecht and changed the name to New Scotland or Nova Scotia. The foremost historian of the Canadian uh, Maritimes estimates that the colony changed hands 10 times between the time of its founding, the very early six, uh, 17th century, and the time that it became a permanent British possession in 1713. Despite the turmoil, the Acadians survived and flourished. They were independent, hardworking farmers with a strong faith. The population grew and the settlement spread despite the fact that they were forced to become British subjects. The Acadians practice a seasonal way of life, uh, which they brought over with them from France, where they had been peasants, part of the French peasantry. But they also had been hired on as 
fur trappers by the companies that ran the colony in its early years. They pledged an oath of allegiance to Britain, though most did under three conditions, religious freedom, neutrality in war, and the right to emigrate. By the 1740s, the French and British were fighting again for control of Nova Scotia. This time, the English decided to expel the Acadians from their homeland. Lieutenant Colonel John Winslow arrived in Grand Pre, Nova Scotia on August 19, 1755. He established his headquarters at the church and summoned more than 400 Acadian men and boys to meet him there. They were declared prisoners of war and by November the 1st, they and 1,100 more of their comrades were shipped to Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. This deportation was repeated in village after village. Acadian men and boys were summoned, imprisoned, and deported to ports unknown. Acadian priests and leaders were arrested and some murdered. The English burned homes, churches, mills, crops, and confiscated livestock. Thriving Acadian villages vanished. The Acadians were plunged into poverty overnight. Families torn apart. Confusion and desperation reigned. The Acadians were left with few possessions and no country to call home. The crime? Their French heritage. In autumn 1755, more than 6,000 Acadians were victims of La Grand Dérangement. This deportation of the Acadians lasted until 1763. In total, more than 10,000 Acadians, 75% of the entire population were deported. Most of the Acadian exiles of 1755 were scattered throughout the English colonies. Some were shipped to England, some back to France, and others to the islands of St. Dominique, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. Well, Rosalie Prejean was born in Nova Scotia. The most important thing about Rosalie coming here to St. Martinville is that she is the only known uh, person that survived of the deportation of Nova Scotia and Santo Domingo. Many believe the first Acadians reached Louisiana as early as 1755, settling at Cabanossi in present-day St. James Parish on the west bank of the Mississippi River. This area, still known as the first Acadian coast, is where I grew up. Family names then match family names now, Arsenault, Bourgeois, Dugas, Guidry, and LeBlanc. Ultimately, thousands of Acadians made Louisiana their new Acadie, and these Cajuns are still proud to call Louisiana home. <laughs> what a fascinating history, and there's still a lot of confusion across the United States about exactly who are the Cajuns and who are the Creoles, and Cajun and Acadian, is it the same thing? Well, we want to talk a little bit about that today as we cook the great foods of, uh, of uh, Louisiana and, of course, of our Cajun heritage. And by the way, you know the biggest, the biggest question I have as a Louisiana Cajun chef, is it hot or not? Well, we're going to answer that today, too. And we have a couple of great guests in the, uh, in the kitchen with us today. First of all, I mentioned the Larry Miller Band right over there. And Larry, why don't you introduce all of the members? I think there's three generations there, right? The same family? Yes, it's, it's the Miller Family Band. And my son, Brian, Bruno Miller, on the guitar. And his son, Blake Miller, on the fiddle. And then my other grandson from a different son is uh, Jay Miller on the triangles, he plays drums and so forth. So and, and where and where are y'all from? We're, we're from Acadia Parish in Iota. Acadia, Acadia Parish. You see, same thing happened to me. I had a spoon, my brother had a fork, so my dad had a knife. <laughs> <laughs> and then right on the right here on the kitchen counter, best seat in the house, y'all, Brenda Komotrahan and her husband, Ray. Can you imagine the challenge I had to come up with a dish to, to, to show Cajun cuisine across the uh, country today? Well, uh, in, in the first days of Acadia, and I know y'all tell the story very well, Samuel Champlain, who was the Frenchman who first established the colony at Port Royal, you know, uh, they're coming from an environment where, uh, you know, the, the weather's fairly pleasant on the coast of France, around Poitou and Vendée in that area, around the Port of Le Havre in France, and they get to Nova Scotia. They get to Acadie, it wasn't Nova Scotia yet. And of course the winters are treacherous and things are cold and the Indians are giving them uh, fits up there. So they decide the best way to get through it is with food. 
So he starts an organization called uh, L'Ordre de Bonton, the Order of the Good Time. And every day, 15 men would go out and hunt and fish or whatever and bring the food back to his camp and cook a great meal. And of course, even in what, 1609 or whatever that time period was, good food was happening in, Nova, in, uh, in Acadie. And of course, uh, uh, now that organization is being founded here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So from that, I'm going to cook a great Cajun dish, y'all. I'm going to cook a real, yeah, that was the first social club in, in the first social club in North America, the first gourmet club mm -hmm. in North America, the order of the good times from Acadie, later to be called Nova Scotia. I'm going to cook a sauce piquant today. A so yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, I, I could have said, you just want a Mercedes or you just want a Jaguar. Oh. <laughs> anyway, y'all, take a look at my, my plate. A nice seafood sauce because I have all of the different seafoods here. The shrimp, I have oysters, I have fish, I have crawfish, I have crab, and oh, look at here. On doing. Tasso. Oh. Tasso, the great smoked meats of the Cajuns. I even have smoked sausage. Now, there's a big school of thought. Do we put sausage in a sauce? Because do we not? Well, it depends if you're cooking at the camp or not. If you're cooking at the camp, anything goes. The hunting camp, anything goes into it. So let's go ahead and get started here. I have my black iron pot nice and hot. And I have in the pot equal parts of oil and flour because I'm creating a wonderful uh, dark brown roux here. Just a fantastic roux. And a roux is the thickening agent of the Cajuns. It's for color, it's for thickening, and it's for flavor. It tastes like nice, rich, Con nutty roasted flavor. Without a roux in a dark color like this, you don't have a gumbo, you don't have a sauce picard or anything like that. Into this pot now, y'all, I'm gonna put some of the basic ingredients to begin all sauce picards. I'm gonna put in a little onion. Should I put celery? Yes, in my neighborhood. Some people say, no, I'll put celery in it. I'm gonna put bell pepper and, of course, garlic. But I think in Cajun cooking, we put whatever's in the ice box, right? Uh, whatever's in the ice box. Uh, so I'm gonna saute this around just a little bit. I'm even gonna put some uh, some of the smoked sausage in it because if you're on the river, you're gonna use andouille or smoked sausage. If you're uh, on the prairies, you're gonna use tasso. Most people do one or the other to put a nice smoky flavor in here. So I'm gonna saute this around for just a minute. And Brenda, I need to ask you one question about the order of the, uh, the order of the Good Times was the first, as I say, a gourmet club or social club in North America, and y'all gonna resurrect it before too long. Is that right? Tell me about That's that. That's right. The first social eating club in North America, and I think uh, Champlain had a fabulous idea, and I think uh, the president of our foundation, Christy Mare, has decided that why not start the social eating club here in Louisiana? And uh, what we plan is to organize a, a, a club of people who are interested in good times and good eating. <laughs> so what yeah, else? Right. I mean, this is we what we do. we got to find somebody in Louisiana <laughs> who likes good eating and good times. Yeah, good luck on finding that. Huh? Well, we need 500 <laughs> of these people. I think it's going to happen. Oh, oh, yeah. Five, well, I'm going to be there. Count, count yes, me you in. Are okay. Coming. Thank All you. right. So, so great. So we have the uh, the roux. You smell that, y'all? Oh, I tell you, really, really, really good here. Y'all, in my sauce pecan, I'm putting shrimp. I'm putting crab I'm putting up I'm putting crawfish oh. You know, look, I could put mud in here and it'd be good now, right? So, I, so I'm going to saute this around just for a second. The smoked meats are really tasting good in here. It's put, making the roux. Take a look at what that looks like right here. With, I put some tomato sauce in to give that nice color. I'm putting some uh, tomatoes that's got some jalapeno in it. And now, y'all, I'm going to put the, the stock. I made a wonderful stock. In fact, is Keith, take a look at this right here. The stock has shrimp shells. Look at that. Oh, all this got crawfish shells, it's got crab shells. So I just go into the pot with the wonderful stock. I would cook this for about 45 minutes to an hour. If I'm at the camp, I'd cook it all day, you know, <laughs> all day long. And I could make this not only with seafood, but I could make it with rabbit, I could make it with squirrel, I could make it with venison. You know how it is in Louisiana. We make it with anything we have available. I'd stir this around, I'd season it with salt and pepper, get it nice and flavorful. And then I have some already done. I would actually serve this 
over white rice. Some people say they serve it over noodles, but <laughs> white rice. Take a look at this, y'all, right here in my pot. It's really nice and full of flavor. You see the color of it, and I'm gonna serve a, I'm gonna give y'all a little taste in a minute. Y'all just stay right where y'all are there. Yo, another element of the annual bushery or hog killing in Louisiana was the production of sausage. Fresh sausage, smoked sausage, and my favorite, on it. All right, here's the, uh, the my favorite table at the bushery, the uh, sausage making, and we're doing, I can see two different kinds of uh, sausages. Troops are grinding uh, uh, one sausage. Now, this is, uh, this is gonna Fresh be Fresh country sauces, which we use to fry and cook like that, and we can also smoke it and make smoke sauces out of it. Right, right. Uh, now, now, Mr. Bailey, you have, a, you have a sausage shop. You do smoked on do and fresh sausages like this as well. That is correct. Now, you can put extra seasonings in this sausage, and, uh, and, and as you say... Um, some it, people love it spicy, and some people love it mild. Yeah. So we make both types, the spicy one and the mild one. And, and this could go either right into the smokehouse or into the frying pan fresh, right? Which Whichever way you want. Now, this is really uh, interesting here, and definitely my favorite sausage uh, cut of the bushery. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, we cut our meat chunky yeah. for, for the undoing sausage because if it's chunky, it, 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 it bends together in the, in, the, in the casing. We use a big beef casing, which is a 50 55 beef casing. Right, right. And uh, when you smoke it, it comes out like a, a all in one together. It's all almost like a ham, ham in like the case. Like a ham, like in a case. Now, now this, uh, this is never eaten uh, fresh. Uh, it's always fresh. smoked. Always this. smoked. Okay, now what about the seasoning in them? Uh, 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 I see troop, there's a lot of meat over there. So what are y'all doing for the seasoning Okay, here? we're gonna put the red pepper, black pepper, and the salt. Troop, you can put all that meat in this pan. Man, that's a lot of good meat. Whew. That's good, Troop. Huh? Um, all right, that Troop, just go ahead and put it in there. Yep. Just fill it on up. All right, good. Now we're gonna put a little black pepper also. And then the same thing, same, uh, same, same thing, thing on undo it, it right? Right. Okay, good. And you want to kind of overseason that. Here you go, Trooper. I'm going to let you put that black pepper on, uh, that red pepper on there. Oh, you know that's good. And while he's seasoning that, uh, Mr. Bailey, tell me about the difference in the casings here because this is two different. Yeah, this that, is a that's very a beef, long. That's a beef casing, which is a Sarge 50 55 casing right. that we use to make undo it because it comes out larger in right. diameter. So this is from the beef uh, cattle. This is from the beef cattle. And a, a, a number 55 casing. And this right here is a number. 28. 28 or 30 boudin yeah. or sausage yeah. casing, right? Yeah, a small so, casing. So once it's all blended together, you just get in there and uh, season it up, and then it goes uh, with two different size uh, right. stuffings, right. okay? Well, good, y'all go ahead, yeah, y'all go ahead and mix. it with a little water. Okay. You kind of fit your, your seasoning all through your meat. Uh, right, okay. Uh, you stuff it. Okay, good. So you just uh, put a little water in, a little right. ice water, keep it, keep that fat cold. Yeah, exactly. huh? Now with the undo it, we don't put too much water to undo it. Um, we try to keep it as, as yeah. As, you grab that piece of fat there, or that's the bacon. Just yeah. with the moisture we got in it. Yeah, right. Good. You don't want it too wet. Okay, well, good. Y'all quit. Y'all keep on going. Then we're gonna come back and watch you stuff it in just a second. Okay. okay. Good. Gotcha. All right, Mr. Bailey, so the uh, meat's all uh, tubed and fully seasoned, fully right? Fully seasoned. Okay, good, and we're filling up filling that. Filling up the stuffer. Oh, that's a really nice uh, stuffer right there, and we got it all in. Now, now, now all of this is gonna come together into one solid sausage oh, uh, in a minute. Sausage, good. That's right. And I noticed the size of this uh, this filling tube right here, that's a really big one. What's that, about an inch uh, in diameter, this right, tube? Right, because we're using that 50 uh, Use, casing. They're yeah, using big, that really beef, big, big, uh, really, big beef yeah. casing. Okay, good. That ought to be enough. Uh, we can put that on the end and see how it comes out. And Now, there's a little clip on the end right here, and that's a little undo it clip. You could tie it. I think in the old days they used to use uh, orange uh, right. needles off right. an orange tree. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Thorns, you can, yeah. yeah. So, um, now, now to undo it, um, how long does it smoke in the smokehouse? About? About five, six hours. Five or six hours. And what type of wood? We use pecan wood. That's the best. Yeah, pecan wood is the best. Pecan wood is the okay. best. Okay. Okay, John. Not Okay, oh my God. Look at the size of that sausage, huh? No wonder that casing has to be so large. <laughs> okay, now, now we would stop That's it right there. It. We'll right stop it right there, right give it a little there. slack. And then we would turn this really nice and tight. And Mr. Bailey, if you can hold that right this. there, we'll take one of these little tiny clips. Uh, the, and the clip is just a little piece of metal with the pliers. 
goes right over the edge of the sausage and then it's clipped shut. And then you just keep on going, right? Right. Okay, good. You see it right here? Thank y'all so much for bringing in my undoing music, huh? Y'all, this is it. This is the undoing sausage. After it comes off of the smoker, it's like a ham on the inside. It's one of the best flavoring ingredients, depending on who you talk to in Louisiana, because every good cook has a different idea of what they're gonna do. What am I doing for your second dish? Well, I'm doing a fantastic dish using the restants, the leftovers. What's, what's left on the table after the crawfish bar? We have the crawfish, the potatoes, the corn, I'm gonna peel all of that and make a wonderful soup out of it. You can thicken it and make a, I guess, almost another uh, sauce pecan if you want to. But before I do that, I have to come and talk to, to Brenda Trahan just a little bit about, do, do, do you get the biggest question, the difference between Cajun and Creole? All the time. Uh, and what all do you the tell time. them in just a, in, in a second? The Creole <laughs> people are those that were born in Louisiana and the Cajun people are those that came here as a, evacuees, refugees, from being deported. What about the, uh, the the poem Evangeline? You know, when we think of Longfellow's great epic, epic poem and people come to Louisiana looking for Evangeline, it, it's actually uh, probably her who cast a spotlight on the Cajun people, right? Uh, they come because they want to see where did this, this beautiful woman wait for her lover yeah. all of her life. And it was supposedly underneath the Evangeline Oak. Yeah. We believe that. And uh, so, so, so the great she, story of her in search of Gabriel, her fiance, and then uh, after he was deported uh, from Nova Scotia, after the English uh, took over, then of course uh, Evangeline came to Louisiana looking for him in the poem by, Evan by uh, Longfellow. So if y'all hadn't read it, read it, everybody. Yes. Uh, what about uh, uh, what about other places of Acadians in, uh, in in the world or in America other than Louisiana? Where can people find the Acadians? Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, especially New Brunswick, there's a lot of Acadians. Of course, all over Louisiana and all over the world, Absolutely. you will and it's find Acadians. Amazing how they've maintained their heritage, no matter where they are. Absolutely. If you go to Maine, they Maine. still the, they still have the great music. They still speak in French. It's fantastic. Now, what about the Acadian Memorial? I know you have somebody here who was instrumental. Oh, also the Acadian in, Memorial was uh, brought about by two women who decided right. that there would there needed to be a story told, the true story, right. not just evangelist story. Right. So, in our audience tonight. We have um, Pat Restweber, who is one of the founders. Right here in that beautiful red dress, right in the front row right there. And I'm going to tell y'all, if you think about Cajun cooking being hot, well, it's not really that hot. It's got great flavor. Of course, we always keep hot sauce on the table. Cayenne pepper goes into some pots, black pepper into the other. But basically, in Cajun cooking, we want to taste our shrimp. We want to taste our crawfish. We want to taste our rabbit. And of course, we want a nice little spice on the back of the, the throat as well. So so hot and fiery, no, not necessarily, but of course, season to taste in Louisiana, so uh, so everybody's a little bit different. So y'all, I have my uh, my uh, wonderful little crawfish corn and potato soup going. I have my onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic. I'm gonna throw my little white flour in here and I'm gonna stir that around. I'm not making a dark roux here. I'm making a velouté, which is a white roux that's thickened, of course, with white flour rather than darkening it too much. And then I'm gonna put my crawfish. Look, if I do this, that's it, right? That's all I need to do. I don't know, a good two pounds of Louisiana crawfish tails down in here. I'm going to put the potatoes because that's going to be the thickening uh, agent. And oh, Keith, look at that pot, huh? All you have to do is look down in here and you're going to know the rest of the story. This is really absolutely beautiful. Seasoning, I'm going to throw a little bit cayenne into it like that. I'm going to put salt. Of course, I'm going to put uh, green onions. I'm going to put parsley. I'm going to put all of those wonderful flavors. And then my stock is made with a nice, rich, bowl oil crawfish, you see that right there. I'm gonna put, of course you could put water in here with this much crawfish, it's gonna taste absolutely wonderful. So y'all, you have to remember that you have to come to Louisiana to experience all of these great, great flavors and you have to go into the countryside of Louisiana to experience all the wonderful things, uh, Cajun and of course Creole as well. Any uh, uh, any happenings year round at the, at the Acadian Memorial that you wanna mention? The National Day of the Acadians 
August 15th. All right. We have a beautiful day where we just celebrate and commemorate our ancestors. Well, I tell you what, it's it's, it's wonderful. No culture pres uh, worth preserving uh, in the world more than uh, those seven great nations of Louisiana that worked so hard to form the foundation of what we call American today. And the Cajun, right up at the top. Good, good food, good fun. And yeah, I think you'll find 500 of them. Y'all, I don't know where time flies when you're enjoying good food and good conversation with friends in the kitchen. Thanks for stopping by as we continue to explore our unique food heritage and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. It was wonderful having y'all. I'm going to finish up this off because... To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Foles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drugstores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. <laughs>